entitled Striving According uh, to His Working, and we looked at uh, three areas that tend to be ignored in the great task, task of world evangelism. Those three areas, our first one was, uh, <clears throat> let me turn my mic on here. The first one was the Word of God, and uh, we saw the importance. Remember, uh, Christ said that the seed must be sown uh, on you know, just uh, sow the seed, all grounds. The seed was the Word of God. It represented the Word of God. We know we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible uh, by the Word of God. And uh, in First Peter, and so the Word of God must be given. And we know the Apostle Paul uh, believed that, the, pow that the, the Word of God had power, had carried the power of God. That's why he said the gospel uh, is the power of God unto salvation. And so our responsibility as believers is to give the Word of God out uh, to preach the gospel, and uh, you know, we uh, the the Christian being a witness, we're not engaging in some salesman mentality of hey, you want to go to heaven? Well, do this, and you can go to heaven. <laughs> that that is not uh, what a witness ought to be doing. The word of God has to be given. We understand that that is where the power of God is. Uh, when we talked about the word of God is inspired of God, it is the breath of God. It carries the life of God. And uh, so uh, that's important in evangelism to give the Word of God out. But the second thing that we looked at particularly is the work of the Holy Ghost. And we understand that um, the Holy Ghost is actively at work uh, in the lives of people. We know when Christ spoke to His disciples, uh, He said that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, will re reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And uh, we looked at several verses that talk about uh, the working of the Holy Ghost in the lives of people. And um, uh, we looked at, um, if you uh, find in your notes there uh, on uh, page 42, uh, we talked about the conviction uh, that is experienced in the life of the individual. Um, there's uh, the conviction, right? The heart is made manifest. On page 43, the heart is convicted. Uh, the heart is pricked. Uh, and then we talked about uh, the producing of conviction. How does conviction happen in the life of someone? Well, by two things, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Uh, and we looked at some examples. Even you remember uh, when uh, uh, Peter preached, when Paul preached, uh, when Stephen preached. <laughs> uh, there was either right uh, a revival or a riot. But both of those were a result of people's conviction. Some people didn't like that conviction. Uh, and in the case of Stephen, they stoned him. And one, even the Apostle Paul, in one case, he was driven out of the city and stoned. Uh, but uh, what happened there? Well, uh, people were, they didn't like the pricking of the heart. Uh, and, you know, the world is the same today. That's why the world tends to not like preachers or anybody that uh, maybe quotes the Bible. Uh, there is a convicting work uh, that uh, the natural man resists and rejects. Uh, and I venture to say that there's a number of people this morning uh, who uh, there was maybe an elongated period of time when you were under conviction and resisting the conviction and opposing that conviction, but uh, eventually, uh, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit of God broke through and uh, you came to know the Lord as your Savior. And so we understand that that is an important part. Uh, we talked about discerning conviction and the opposing of conviction, uh, uh, the uh, Conviction of the Holy Spirit of God can be resisted and rejected, and we looked at some references there. But thirdly, this morning, on page 46, I want us to consider uh, the will of man. Now, all three of those go together. The Word of God, the work of the Holy Ghost, and the will of man. Uh, the Apostle Paul mentioned his testifying to the Jews and Greeks in Acts chapter 20, and uh, this passage helps us understand how a person is converted. Notice in Acts 20:21, uh, 20, uh, Paul says, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, notice, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ himself preached this same message of repentance and faith in Mark 1:15. Christ said and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and Believe the gospel. So understand, you, you have that combination in the word of God of a repenting, a turning, and a, but a turning to someone specific. And that's important when it comes to repentance. Repentance is not feeling bad for sin. A lot of people feel bad for their sin. There are many people today in jail who feel bad for perhaps some sin that they committed. 
and they live with the consequences for the rest of their lives, but that's not enough to save a man. Uh, it's not just a, a, a repentance, or re, that's not what just repentance means, is it is a repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Both repentance and faith, according to Hebrews 6.1, stand at the foundation of a man's salvation. For example, in Hebrews 1.6, at the end of Hebrews chapter 5, um, now I believe the Apostle Paul wrote, penned the book of Hebrews, but you know, that's not a matter of separation, but it's just my personal belief. But at the end of chapter 5, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, writes about the believer's maturity. And he says that, you know, some of you should have been teachers by now, but you have need of milk. And then he goes on in chapter, uh, chapter number 6 and says, uh, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. So there, there he says, look, we should have moved beyond some of the basic doctrines uh, of the Christian faith, uh, and really you've seen your immaturity as Christians, and so uh, Paul here talks about those two foundational things when it pertains to man's salvation. They'd often move way beyond that, but there's still struggle there among those Hebrew Christians concerning those doctrines. So it is important to understand that repentance and faith are inseparable. A man can feel bad about his sin, but that is not enough to save that man. A man may know in his mind that Jesus died on the cross mentally and make a mental assent to it, but that is not enough to save that man. And so, uh, notice here on page 36, repentance toward God and faith towards Jesus Christ. And let's explain both of those things. Repentance toward God is because we are sinners before God. Uh, right? The call is a repentance because we stand as sinners before a holy God. And faith towards Jesus Christ is because Christ alone is the sufficient sacrifice for our sins. So understand, when we're talking about repentance and faith, we're talking about one thing. It is a, a seeing ourselves as sinners before God, but in salvation turning to Christ. It is not just a, oh man, God forgive me for my sin. I feel bad for my sin. You know, a lot of people in religion do that. They somehow try to appease, they feel bad for their sin, but there is never a faith in the person and the work of Christ. And that's important. So it's repentance toward God because before a holy God we're guilty of being sinners, but it's a turning in faith uh, towards the Lord Jesus Christ. So in order to be saved, a man must repent of sin because he sees himself as exceeding, exceeding sinful before a holy God, and he responds to his condition by placing his faith in Christ who alone is the sufficient sacrifice for sin. Now consider a few things on page 37. Number one, we see repentance toward God. Let's talk about this repentance. Jesus Christ preached this message of repentance and faith. Uh, notice in saying, and by the way, you find that combination both in the Old and the New Testament. For example, you remember, uh, we'll see that example, uh, I think, in those notes, maybe it's not in, in, in these notes, but with Jonah, you remember, uh, what was the call? They had to repent, uh, and uh, they had to uh, turn and place their faith. And so we find here Jesus Christ preached in Mark 1.15. He says, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. In Matthew 9.13, Jesus said, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Robert Sargent, in uh, his uh, book, The Principles of Personal Evangelism, writes, says, Repentance is probably the most misunderstood aspect of evangelism. Perhaps a spinoff from the megachurch movement that began in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, or form um, a surge of celebrity salvation professions, or, simply from, uh, or uh, um, simply from attempts to make the gospel more palatable and appealing, Repentance has become the missing ingredient in many uh, presentation of the gospel. It has been called the great omission. Uh, and what he simply describes today is what you find in um, a lot of churches today who are speaking of Christ and of salvation in Christ. The problem is there's never any mention of sin. Uh, and the appeal is simply is like this. Would you like to go to heaven? Well, yeah. Okay, well... Just commit your life to Christ. That's the extent of it. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, where is sin? <laughs> and actually, why do we need Christ? 
You see, this idea today that Christ can come in your life and make your life better, uh, salvation is much more than that. Salvation is being saved from sin and from eternal damnation and separation from God. Hell is a real place. Do you believe that this morning? I hope you do because that's what the Bible teaches. And that's what we're saved from. Now, do I ultimately believe that Christ makes your life better? Yes, I do. Uh, but that's a result of salvation. That's not salvation itself. Uh, and so we find here <clears throat> that the importance of this aspect of sin being dealt with and then repentance. Now, consider repentance. How do we explain repentance? Well, the word repent or repentance means a change of one's mind uh, to think differently, uh, to reconsider. Uh, many have uh, come to define repentance as a change of mind resulting in a change of action. Uh, and so, uh, by the way, uh, the word repent, that's what it simply communicates. It is when someone truly repents, uh, then there is a change of that person's life. Um, and so, though we define repentance, uh, it is often in the Bible uh, found as the word turn. To repent means to turn. So that's what the word means. Simply put, it means to turn. You're turning, you're changing your mind about something. And perhaps in salvation we say you're changing your mind about yourself, your own sinful condition. Uh, you're changing your mind about God, right? About who you think He is. Uh, you're changing your mind about how a person can uh, receive forgiveness of sin. It's not your own effort, but you change your mind in that it's not by works, it's by grace through faith. And so uh, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about repentance. And so it's an understanding of turning from your previous opinions and your previous perspective about things into the biblical perspective. But consider, secondly, the repentance exemplified. You know, the modern church philosophy invites people to come as they are and to stay as they are. Now, Christ, let me make it clear, will save anyone and everyone, <laughs> okay? Uh, no matter where they've, whatever they've done, no matter where they've been, Christ died for all men. He died for all sin. There's not a person in the world who you could say, man, they've done too many sins, they cannot be saved. Uh, Christ died for all sin. Uh, that's important to understand that at the cross of Calvary, understand every single filth and sin and wickedness that could ever be done was paid for on the cross of Calvary. Sin died uh, with Christ there on the cross of Calvary. And so there's not someone whose sin uh, cannot be uh, forgiven. Uh, but here we find that the philosophy of the day is come as you are and stay as you are. This contemporary movement is convincing sinners that God is not concerned with their sin, that He accepts the sinner as He is. Uh, I agree with the second part, not the first part. God accepts the sinner as He is, but He is concerned with sin. That's the whole reason why He came, because of sin. Uh, consider a few examples in Scripture. Job clearly changed his mind about himself when he said, remember, I abhor myself. Because of that change of mind, Job could not help but repent in dust and ashes. When his mind changes, it manifests itself in action. In Job 42, verse 6, Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. In other words, Paul, I mean, uh, Job, how do we know he was repentant? It was just uh, the fact that he says, oh yeah, I, I, you know, uh, now I understand. No, there was something in his life that was an evidence of that. Uh, two things are, are connected to repentance in Jeremiah 35 verse, uh, 31, verse 19. You have a person who is ashamed. That shame comes from a change of mind. That person smites his uh, thigh. Notice uh, um, such an action has come about. Uh, because of his shame. Notice Jeremiah 31, 19. Surely after I was turned, I repented, and after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh, I was ashamed, yea, even, my, uh, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. So notice here, that is a repentant heart. It is not just, again, uh, the repentance is evidence uh, is exemplified as something that is seen in a person's life. Uh, and so repentance, we see also, is evidence in a twofold way. First, in 2 Timothy 2.25, by an acknowledging of the truth. And second, by a recovering out of the snare of the devil. Notice 2 Timothy 2.25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, 
If God peradventure will give them repentance, notice, so how is that defined? To the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. So that is repentance here uh, exemplified for us in that it is um, an acknowledging of the truth, right? So there's a change that happens. You, you did not acknowledge the truth, but now you're acknowledging the truth. That means there's been a change of mind. Now the truth has been acknowledged. And then it goes further in that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And so we find here repentance uh, exemplified. Repentance also is described as an ad uh, admission of sin and furthermore a return unto God from the heart. Notice in 1 Kings uh, 8, 40, 47. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carry them captive saying we have sinned and have done perversely we have committed wickedness and so return unto thee with all their heart so there it is repentance you see that it is exemplified we have sinned we have done perversely we have committed wickedness and so we return you see that that is repentance exemplified in the Word of God. Uh, but let's consider repentance illustrated. There are several illustrations in the Word of God about repentance. We consider one in Matthew 12, 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. So here Christ, as he's speaking, He's giving the example, obviously he's talking here to the Jews. He came to his own, his own received him not. And he uh, shows them that they were unwilling to repent. And he gives the back to an example of Nineveh. And so Jesus Christ here, and as he mentions Nineveh and the preaching of Jonah and the repentance of the people of Nineveh, consider what was included in this repentance. First of all, according to Jonah chapter 3 verse 5, they believed God. Secondly, in the same verse, they proclaimed a fast. Thirdly, they put sackcloth. And then fourthly, in verse number 8 of chapter 3, they turned from their evil way. And so here, Christ, when he speaks of repentance, this is what it all entails. They believe God, they proclaim a fast, they put sackcloth, and they turn from their evil way. Now, understand, we're talking about salvation, of repentance toward God and faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must understand what repentance is. You see, someone just saying, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. And to make a mental ascent to it is uh, falls short of a realization of why they need Christ. And so a repentance is, again, a turning uh, from uh, a change of mind again from what was previously acknowledged. And now there's an acknowledging of the truth. Uh, there's an understanding of one's condition before a holy God. And then there's a turning in faith particularly in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've looked at repentance particularly, but let's look at faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And look, by the way, those two will go together. I don't believe it's two steps. It's one thing. It's repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. True salvation is found in those two things. Uh, faith is believing in Christ and His finished work on the cross of Calvary. That faith delivers the sinful man from God's a just punishment. In Hebrews 11 verse, uh, verse 1, the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so we find here uh, faith is described. <clears throat> now don't think that faith is this thing of, uh, uh, oh, I mean, there's, uh, there's, look, he says it is the evidence of things not seen. So there is evidence, <laughs> okay? Uh, that is uh, present when we're talking about uh, faith. It is the substance. Think about the word substance means it is something that is concrete, something that is real. Faith is something real. It's not abstract. It's not fake. Uh, it is something that is real. Uh, but faith uh, is believing, and believing is receiving. Notice in John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So faith is believing, believing is receiving. The word believe means to accept, 
to trust, to depend on, to rely on, uh, to commit to. And so uh, it is found in the word believing, in the word faith. And so uh, we find another one, the word believe means to accept, again, notice in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we've looked at <clears throat> repentance toward God and turning to Christ. It's not just feeling bad for sin, it's understanding our condition before a holy God and turning to faith in Christ. Uh, and here he explains it a different way as he says that we're saved by grace, notice, through faith. So, uh, grace, uh, we can describe it as God giving. Uh, we talked about unmerited favor. We don't deserve the grace of God, but he gives it to us uh, freely by grace. You see, grace means it is not something we can earn. <laughs> it's something that has been done. It is a, that's why in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it is the gift of God. You don't earn a gift. It is given out of love. It is uh, not something you deserve, but it is so we're saved by grace, so God gives us, right? Uh, he imputes the righteousness of Christ upon our account. And so that's the grace of God. He gives us a home in heaven. He gives us, uh, as we'll see uh, in the morning message in the book of Ephesians, so many things that are part of that salvation. It is, the, it is the grace of God. We can't earn that. So that's God giving. Grace is God giving. But faith, we're saved by grace, through faith. How is the gift of God appropriated? By faith. So grace is God giving and faith is man receiving. Uh, and so um, we find here, uh, you know, some have falsely declared that believing is a work. It's not a work. Um, the word of God shows plainly that to be untrue. Consider, let's go to Galatians 2.16. I know it's in your notes there, but consider the word of God here, Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So see, the works of the law stands in contrast to believing by faith in Jesus Christ. So those who would say, well, you know, believing is a work. No, it's not. It's put in contrast in the Word of God with works. So believing cannot be works because it stands as the opposite. And so uh, we're talking about repentance toward God and turning in faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Now consider, according to the Bible, it is by faith that we receive remission of sin, Acts 10.43. It is by faith that we are justified, Romans 5.1. It is by faith that we are the children of God, Galatians 3.26. It is by faith that we know we have eternal life, 1 John 5.13. It is faith that is counted for righteousness, Romans 4, 3 through 5. You see, a man cannot be justified before God by good works. It is unthinkable uh, and un unmistakable in Scripture that justification before God is only obtained by grace through faith. Consider, a man cannot be justified by the deeds of the law, Romans 3, 20. A man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, Romans 3, 28. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Number four, a man is saved by grace through faith, not of works. So we understand the scripture is clear uh, concerning the salvation of man. The word of God teaches us that the sinner can be reconciled to God by the propagation of the word of God, the work of the Holy Ghost, and the willful response of man to the word of God and to the work of the Holy Ghost. And so consider those three things. In my witness, I must personally be faithful to declare the word of God. We found that's what's priority number one. We have to give the word. Of, that's our responsibility. Give the word of God out. Secondly, in my witness, I must be aware of the ongoing work of the Holy Ghost in the lives of men. You see, God is at work, and often he is already at work before even we show up. <laughs> You know, uh, Paul put it this way, he says, uh, <clears throat> you know, some people are involved in the sowing, 
and some people are involved in the reaping. But whatever happens, God gives the increase. So it, it doesn't matter where we are. Our responsibility is to give the word of God out and to understand that there is the ongoing work of the Holy Ghost in the lives of men. Uh, God is actively at work. And let's not be disappointed. Often we may witness to someone and someone may show really no response at all and even uh, seem to be hard and cold. But understand, the Holy Ghost is at work. And he can work in the lives of people. And I think uh, if you've lived long enough, you've seen perhaps some of the hardest souls turn to Christ. That's the evidence of the work of the Spirit of God. You see, there are certain walls that men cannot break down that only the Holy Ghost can break down. And so we find that to be true. And that's what we must be fully aware as we witness to people. Uh, but thirdly, my witness, I must encourage men to repent of sin and place their faith in Christ. You see... We really have to be diligent because of the confusing world that we live in. You know, I often meet, th this is <clears throat> a reg regular conversation I often have. I uh, ask someone if they know uh, that their sins have been forgiven, that they have a home in heaven, and I ask them, are they confident in that, or are they, uh, do, do they have the assurance uh, of eternal life? And often, people will say, yes. And so if I proceed to ask them and say, well, uh, how are you certain about that? Or, you know, how would you explain that to me? And the typical response is this. Well, you know, I would say you'd be a good person. You live a good life and you, you know, uh, you know, uh, live by the Ten Commandments, be a good neighbor, you know, uh, live by the golden rule. That typically is how the conversation goes. Then I proceed to give them the gospel. And then I encourage them to, uh, you know, um, Consider themselves in their sinful condition before God and turn in faith in Christ who is the substitute for their sin and to place their faith in the finished work of Christ. And typically, by the end of the conversation, it ends somehow like this. Well, you know, I did that before. And you get more into details and you find, uh, well, well, yeah, I was watching, uh, and there's different various ways, but it all, uh, I was watching somebody online and, you know, uh, they told me to pray a prayer and I prayed a prayer. But I'm going back to the beginning. I said, well, wait a minute. You told me you were saved by being a good person. You see, there's really no understanding. There was never a point. Somehow along the line, someone said, you want to go to heaven? Oh, yeah, go to heaven. You just uh, pray a prayer. Hey, just believe in Jesus. And there is really no dealing of sin, of guilt before a holy God. And fundamentally, there's no understanding as to why Jesus came. You see, Jesus came... To die for sinners. That's why he came. And we must be uh, very careful as we deal with people. We must point them to the two things that are uh, important in life. As we give the gospel, we must deal with sin. We must uh, help people understand that they are sinners before a holy God. And that the condemnation because of their sin is an eternity in a place called hell. And then that's when the good news of Jesus Christ comes in. You see, that's why God loves you. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die and to pay for your sin debt. Now, what's amazing is often people who say something like, oh, yeah, I've done this before. When you explain it to them, they'll say something like this. I've never heard that before. Well, wait a minute. You just told me you believe Jesus Christ. You prayed a prayer. But they never heard that Christ was the substitute for their sin. You see, it is important for us as we give the gospel out. You know, uh, in, in my own life, when, uh, you know, growing up in a preacher's home, uh, a missionary home, right, a missionary kid, uh, I was around church, I was around the Bible, uh, and really my entire life just was submerged in the Word of God, whether it was in church and family devotions or scripture memorization, as many children do uh, here and all those things. Um, but it wasn't until I, when I was eight years old that the Holy Spirit of God convicted me of my sin. And for the first time, I realized, wait a minute, Christ died on the cross for my sins. It was my sins that he paid. You know, before then, as a missionary kid, I thought, well, Dad, go reach all the heathen out there. You know, I'm in the Christian home, and we're... We're, we're the good people here, and, you know, I got all those people involved in all those things. That they need to get saved. They need the Lord. 
And really there was no, did I, you, if you'd ask me, do I believe in Jesus? I would say yes. If you'd ask me, do you believe that Jesus died for your sin? I would say yes. I memorized all the scriptures. I knew it mentally. But there, there had to be that moment in my life when I realized, wait a minute. I'm the sinner before a holy God. And before a holy God in my sinful condition, under, and as a, even as a year old boy, under the intense conviction of the Holy Spirit of God, I acknowledged myself as a sinner, and I turned to Christ. And the Lord changed my life even as a year old boy. You see, there's a lot of confusion out there, and so as God's people... We must look at those three areas when we seek to evangelize. And that's why Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, he says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, notice, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. You see, that's what we need to do. We need to be striving according to His working. And so for that to be true, we must give the Word of God out. We must be conscious of the work of the Holy Ghost. And we must encourage people to get to the place where they see themselves as a sinner before a Holy God. And that's going to take place as we communicate to them. Uh, and by the way, someone will be in a great state of appreciation when they truly understand why Christ came. You know, this whole, uh, you know, idea that, and that's what the philosophy today is, you know, make a commitment to Christ, you'll make your life better. You know, that's the, the, um, um, the prosperity gospel out there. You know, Christ will take all your problems away. Just believe in Christ, he'll take all your problems away. No. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you're still going to have problems after you become a Christian. Uh, Christ came to die for our sins. That's why he came. Now, do I believe that your life will drastically improve once you get saved? Yes, I do. I do believe that with all my heart. Um, but uh, we must point people to uh, the, uh, the right things as we give the word of God out. And by the way, think about why would we be involved in something different than the Holy Ghost is involved in? What is the Holy Ghost doing? Convicting men of sin. So why would we not mention sin? in our witness. Because that's what the Holy Ghost is doing. You see, if we ignore that part, the repentance before a holy God part, uh, we're missing uh, really the, the, where the, the work of the Spirit of God begins in the life of a man. And so, uh, may the Lord help us uh, with uh, this aspect of our witness. Striving according uh, to His working. Let's pray.